What's up? I'm Coach Dan Blewett. In today's video, we're going to talk about what to look for in a pitching coach. All right, so if you're looking for a new pitching coach to do lessons with, or maybe you're considering joining a new team and you're trying to like kind of interview and like see if this might be a good fit for you. So in this video, I'm going to go into a couple things that I think make a bad pitching coach that are red flags that you should be looking for. All right, so number one, a good pitching coach never speaks in absolutes and they don't try to force players into a box. And what I mean by that is, Pitching mechanics are like snowflakes. You know, they all have a, a similar structure, right? But everyone is different. Literally every, every pitcher has a different leg kick, you know, a different torso lean, a different stride length. They all do the similar things, right? Like consistent, right? Like just a car, all cars have tires, all cars have axles. All pitchers get to certain points in the delivery, but I don't need to make any pitcher look exactly like me or look exactly like Greg Maddox or look exactly like anyone else. And there are there aren't that many absolutes when it comes to pitching. There are checkpoints. But if a coach says you have to do this to be successful, that's probably not correct. So I'm not saying that all absolutes or if they're saying that this is a thing I firmly believe in is wrong. But just be wary if you see coach says you have to do this, have to do that, have to do that. You're, you've got to pitch this. You can't pitch the way you're too many absolutes should be a red flag. A good pitching coach is always open-minded, understands that players are going to have different needs and they're going to be flexi flexible in what they teach and what they're going to ask you to do. So if you feel like you're being really constrained to pitch a certain way and there's not a lot of leeway from it, that should be a red flag to you with that pitching coach. Number two, they shouldn't be only teaching what they were taught as a kid. And you see this a lot. And there's a thing called belief persistence. It's when people hold on to long-held beliefs even when lots of new evidence is presented to the count to the to the contrary. So for example, I still believe in Santa Claus. Well, I don't. Say I still believed in Santa Claus as a kid despite realizing that it's physically impossible to do pretty much all the stuff that he does. If I were to continue to believe in Santa Claus as a grown-up, you'd be like, "What are you doing?" And you're basically just doing mental gymnastics to continue to believe that thing despite overwhelming new evidence that it's not. There are lots of things like this in pitching. Um, a lot of this, especially in softball overhand throwing mechanics, you see just people holding on to stuff they were taught as a kid. And because they learned it in this like rosy, you know, nice time in their life when they're playing baseball and having fun, um, and they re really respected that coach, they really just struggled to let go of that stuff and say, you know what, that coach that I really loved, who really supported me, um, and they really cared about me, but he, he just didn't really know what he was talking about for certain things. There were a lot of dumb drills done in the 80s and 90s. There's a, there a lot of dumb drills in the 90s and 2000s. I did a bunch of them. I've taught some drills that I was later like, oh man, Dan, that was probably not the smartest drill that you were teaching that just probably didn't have a very good reason that you were doing it. So what every coach should be teaching is stuff that they've vetted, that they've, you know, someone else says, hey, why do you teach that? Well, I teach it because X, Y, and Z, or why am I giving it to this player? Because of X, Y, and Z. There should always be reasons it applies to you, not a reason it's just like in my tool bag forever in general. I've had, again, I've had a lot of drills sort of change over over time. I've developed new drills. I've taken new drills from other coaches. I've said, you know what? That guy's way of doing that seems actually a little better than the way I've been doing it. I'm going to use that and I'm going to grow. So coaches should not be just teaching what they were taught as a kid. And there should be a certain amount of modern influence that you see in the things that they're teaching. So if, if they're really far back in like the, you know, 2000s, 90s, 80s, in what it seems like they're teaching, and there's very little influence from some of the modern stuff, then that should strike you as a red flag. Number three, they shouldn't just be blindly following someone else's program. And this is something you see in some baseball academies around the country Well, they'll be doing like the the pitching professional program. It's an eight week velocity program. It's like, why are we following someone else's program? Like you're a pitching coach. You're the one supervising my kid. You're the one training him. Why aren't we doing your specific eight week program that you've had experience with that you've changed and adapted and developed over time? That's a big red flag for me. If you're a trainer, you're a coach and you're doing someone else's stuff, you you might take their stuff and make it a template and tweak it for you know your own purposes, but to really just do it cookie cutter is a really big red flag. I don't think you would really accept that from a personal trainer, like in the weight room, would you? Like if you're paying me $100 an hour to do personal training with you, but I'm just reading off a program that you know some other world-class trainer is, is doing, that would be weird, I think. You'd be like, you're here with me, you should be tailoring this to me, not just following someone better than you. 
Um, so if they're blindly following some cookie cutter program and you're paying for this in person, you know, again, there's always some give and take. So you can't just blank. I don't want you to just blanket assume that this guy's bad or this guy doesn't know what he's doing because of that. But again, every pitching coach should be teaching what they know, what they've experienced, what they've tailored and, and adjusted and developed over time, rather than always going, just grabbing some other cookie cutter new thing and saying, this is what my program is going to teach now. Number four, they should teach pitching, not just velocity or throwing. I know everyone wants to throw 125 miles per hour, uh, but guess what? Pitchers in the major leagues are less durable than ever. They have shorter careers than ever. They throw less strikes than ever. They walk more hitters than ever. It's not a good trend. So if you want to be this like replaceable player in the major leagues, which everyone wants to be in the major leagues, even if it's just for a second, like I get that. But look, they're not incompatible that you can do both that you can have some portion of your brain power focusing on actually throwing the ball where it needs to go and also while training to increase velocity. In my academy, we tried to find that balance. You know, we did stuff to increase players' velocity and every player increased their velocity consistently year over year, but we weren't so obsessed with it that we couldn't still focus on learning really good changeups and really honing your changeup and really honing your breaking ball and honing your command. So they're not incompatible. Just understand that. So if you're only doing velocity work all winter and then you're just hopping on a mound at the end and throwing it as hard as you can off the mound, that's not really a good plan. There needs to be some amount of finesse built into the program, whether it's from your flat grounds where maybe one or two days a week, you know, you have uh, velocity stuff, but the other two days a week you're doing, you know, flat grounds and really working on your changeup and really focusing not at all on the velocity, but, you know, locating it and feeling for the pitch. That's important stuff. And you need to be throwing a lot on your own too, because if you're not throwing a lot, if you're only going to velocity program to throw, you're not going to get that finesse on your own. You should be throwing consistently more than just once or twice a week in an academy. You should be playing catch with your buddies on your own, find time at the school gym, throw in the backyard with dad, even if it's cold, whatever. But most players, if they're getting ready for the season, they're going to be throwing five days a week. And three of those days are going to be low effort. Those are the days you spin your breaking ball, you work on your command, you, you throw your change up and your pitching coach should be teaching you how to do that stuff. And if they're not, that's a red flag because pitchers have to pitch. I know more, more players than ever, even at the highest levels are just sort of throwers who have a breaking ball, but you want to be as much of a pitcher as you can while still meeting your physical and your velocity goals. Lastly, if your pitching coach says lots of confusing stuff. And I know it's sort of like my brand to be simple and to be easy to understand. And I do that specifically because this stuff is not that hard to explain. Like, yeah, biomechanics and, you know, all these different joint angles are important. But look, this is called elbow flexion. When you bend, when you straighten, it's called extension. When you bend your elbow, it's called flexion. But guess what? I don't need to tell you that it's called flexion because who cares? Your elbow is bent. Bend your elbow to 70 degrees. You could flex your elbow to 70, degree, 70 degrees, or you could just bend it like a normal human would talk. When coaches are over explaining stuff and they're making it sound really complicated and you don't really follow what they're saying, it's usually a sign that they don't understand it that well because they're trying to sound smart and they're afraid of simplifying. I'm not afraid of simplifying stuff because I know that I know pitching pretty well. I'm not the world's expert on pitching, but I know that I know it well enough where I'm not afraid and it doesn't challenge my masculinity to say bent elbow instead of flexed elbow, you know, because I want you to understand. And if I understand it, my goal is to present it to you, no matter what your skill level is, no matter what your knowledge of baseball is, so that you can understand it. So if you're a parent and you don't have a baseball background, or you have a modest baseball background, or you're a 14-year-old kid, and you go to your pitching coach, and you're like, I don't know what the heck he just said. He's talking all about joint angles and flexion and, you know, hyper abduction. I don't, I don't really know what he's telling me. That's not a great sign. It's not to say they're not a, they're not good at what they do. It's not to say they can't help you get better because they they probably can, but it's just like not a great sign. And you should ask them be like, look, I want to understand, but when you use these big terms, I don't understand because I'm 14 or I'm an accountant or I'm a lawyer and this isn't what I study, right? You can't expect like I don't expect to get legalese from a lawyer if they want me to understand what I'm supposed to be doing. They're going to try to simplify it for me because I'm not a lawyer, right? So it's just, I think, respectful of people's intelligence and the fact that people aren't experts in every field to simplify pitching mechanics and explain them in a simple way. So if your pitching coach 
is running around with tons of confusing stuff and you really don't know what they're what they're talking about and they don't make an effort to, to dumb it down for you, it's going to be hard for you long term to be a student of your craft and to really understand your own mechanics well. And that's the biggest thing that you're going to get from a pitching coach is that they help you understand your body and your mechanics and what makes you at your best and what makes you at your worst so that you can continue to self-coach when you're not with them. So that the fact that they're going to give you this knowledge in a simplified form so that you can understand it, understand yourself, it's a really important thing, actually. So if you don't feel like you understand your mechanics from your pitching coach, then you might need to find someone who can help you understand yourself better. Because again, that self-knowledge and that self-awareness is really important long term. So Hopefully today's video was helpful. I'm not trying to criticize anyone. This is just, you know, general my thoughts about pitching. Um, and obviously it's it's an opinion. But if you're looking for a pitching coach and you're not sure what to look for, I think these factors that we talked about today are a good place to start because you want to find someone that you can have a good relationship with long term and who's local to you and who cares about you. And that's the last thing. Your pitching coach should generally care should genuinely care about you. Not like you send them a, a text like, hey, I had a good game. They're like, oh, hey, can you give me some love on Twitter? Because I know a pitching coach like that. Um, you don't want that guy as your pitching coach. You want someone who just really just cares about you as a person in addition to how well you play on the field. But they really they should know that baseball is just a fun thing you do and they're helping you get better at it. So you have more fun and learn all the big life lessons that you get from baseball. All right. So if you have any comments or questions, leave them in the description below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.